So some of you in here might be wondering that I look nothing like my picture in the app. Uh, I just had someone come up and approach me about that. Uh, I tried to get Ryan, who happens to be my husband, to do this talk for me. I was like, look, the app says you're going to be the one doing the talk. Uh, he didn't buy it, though, so you're, you, you get to look at me instead. So I'm going to talk about fractals today, and I'm going to try to hopefully make them practical for you. Uh, but to start, I'm going to tell a story about a friend of mine. Her name was Jen. We went to high school together, and then we went off to different colleges. And so I hadn't seen her in a while when I decided to visit her one summer. And I go into her apartment, and she has all these wonderful pictures of fractals and posters all over her apartment. She had Mandelbrot set, Julia set, all, all beautiful things. And I got really excited, because she'd never really been into math. I, I was really a surprise to me. We'd known each other for years, and I just never really thought she was that into math. And so I said, wow, Jen, I didn't know you like fractals. And she gave me a very, very blank stare. And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, all those posters you have, you know, you have all these fractals on your, on your walls. And she said, what is that? So I said, oh, OK. You know, and to be honest, I, I kind of thought that maybe she knew what they were because, it, you know, we, we were old enough that, uh, you know, Jurassic Park had come out recently and everybody had gotten really excited about chaos theory because of Jeff Goldblum's character. And so I thought, well, maybe she went out and she read a book because we didn't have Wikipedia back then. But, but no, she had just went to the store and she'd bought them because they were really pretty. And so I had, to sat down, I had to sit down and kind of walk her through what these were and how they worked. And when I was all done, she thanked me and said that now she loved the posters even more, which is great because otherwise we couldn't have stayed friends. Um, it would have been <laughs> over at that moment. Because I am and always have been a math geek. In fact, the only reason I got into computer science was it was the one degree where I was guaranteed a job and I could do math most of the time. This is a picture of me in middle school. I was on the math team, so that meant that I liked to get up on Saturday mornings at 7 a.m. to ride a bus for an hour to go to some rural school to take a math test for fun. <laughs> and so I had read about fractals in this wonderful book, um, Chaos Making a New Science by James Gleick. And to be honest, I will admit that that was inspired by Jurassic Park. So it, it did trigger me to go do this. It inspired me so much that I took the time to write my very first program for fun. I did uh, the logistic map in C++. The logistic map, which I have up here, is one of the simplest equations you can represent from chaos theory, which is that basically you kind of iterate over a really simple function, and you watch the behavior as you change different values of it. And as you change those values and you iterate, you get to see really chaotic behavior as represented by this image. And so I took the time, I, I really basic plain old C++ program, and just spit it out. And I was so excited, I showed it to my calculus teacher. And he was excited, too. It was great. Ever since that moment, I wanted an excuse to use fractals because I just loved the idea of these really simple equations um, making these complex and sometimes very beautiful things. And so I thought one day, maybe one day, I'll get an opportunity to use them. And then I went through my whole college degree and got my first job and kind of gave up a little hope uh, until I got to work with navigation systems. So navigation systems are interesting because they deal with geographic data, which is by nature multiple dimensions. Uh, we always have a latitude and a longitude. Sometimes we go to three dimensions because sometimes we care about elevation or even something more abstract, like sometimes we care about how roads are layered on top of each other. And as part of our jobs in dealing with that kind of data is that we're constantly trying to find ways to squeeze those multiple dimensions into one because that makes our lives easier. We don't have to reason about all these different values. We can just reason about the one value that we've formed out of them. And so in essence, we're just constantly looking for some sort of function um, that will take our two values, or if it's many values in a much more um, dimensional world, and just kind of map it onto a single value that represents the full semantics of the multidimensional data that we are playing with. And once we do that, we can very easily solve the types of problems that come up in multidimensional worlds, like a range query, which asks what subset of the data is in within the range of these values. 
uh, and geographic systems that usually forms kind of a box. So we're trying to figure out what things fix, fit in this box, or if it's more elaborate, it might be a polygon. Uh, we might be looking for things that are near other things. So, you know, a point in the map, you know, what other items are near that point? What is the closest police station or the closest fast food restaurant? And then we can generalize that even more and say we care more than about just one thing. We want the 10 things or the 20 things that are closest to this item in the data. And the funny thing is that uh, K-nearest has kind of become a loaded term a little bit. It, there's multiple versions of the problem, and I find that when I talk about K-nearest from my understanding of it, which is, comes from this multidimensional search space, I often find people who are really into machine learning and clustering, and they're like, you mean the clustering algorithm? I'm like, well, that's one form of it. That's not the only form. In fact, uh, Donald Knuth talked about uh, nearest neighbor in The Art of Computer Programming, and he renamed it the post office problem because the idea was uh, you have a house and you need to figure out what post office to assign that house to. So that term's been around for a while, but it's gotten a lot of traction lately with clustering. And so we could solve this with brute force. We could. We could take the time and we could basically look at all the points in the data set and we could come up with some function that represents Euclidean distance and we could just basically look and see, you know, what's the closest thing based on that distance measure. Um, but that doesn't sound like fun. And I got into math and I got into computer science because I thought it was fun. So I want to do better than that. Also, usually in any system we work with, we're dealing with some sort of constraint. You know, we don't have all the power in the world. We don't have all the memory in the world. And so we want to be a little more clever. We want to find a way to optimize, to use some sort of data structure or algorithm that's going to make this easier on us. And usually, most of those data structures or algorithms require that we have some way to order the data. We may have to sort it. Um, we may just have to bucket it. But there's got to be something inherent to how the data is ordered so we can work with that data structure. And ordering usually requires a comparison. We have to find one way of knowing that something should come before something else for that to work. And I would argue that that comparison function is actually that mapping of those dimensions into a single one. Um, and what I mean by that is that, well, let me get to that in a minute. So this is a typical comparison function we might see or write when we're dealing with multiple fields. I'm sure a lot of people in this room, this is Julia code, so maybe not this exact form of it, but a lot of people in this room have written something that looked like this at one point in their careers, um, hopefully early on, you're not doing it anymore but where you basically had an um, object of some sort or a type of some sort that had multiple members in it and you needed to compare them. And so you had to pick one field to test for equality and only if that is equal do you look at the other fields and you progress on down and that's how you order them. That has a problem and that problem is that when we deal with multidimensionals, multidimensional data uh, and we have these two fields, it doesn't always work out right. For example, right now we're here. We're in the Peabody Opera House. This is the location of this place. And if I did that approach, I would find this Long John Silver's as the closest fast food restaurant. Doesn't look bad, except that's where it is. And if you're geographically challenged and you don't believe me, <laughs> we are here in St. Louis. And you draw a straight line across the map, you end up in Sacramento, California. So that's why that happens. So I'm going to visualize some things as I talk through what we really should be doing. And to vi I'm very much a visual person. I always draw pictures. If you're ever in a meeting with me, um, I'll just like stop and get up and just drawing on the whiteboard because I have to see things in order to understand them. And so I'm going to assume other people in the room are like me, and I'm just going to use lots and lots of pictures in this. So one of the visualizations I'm going to start out with is this grid. Um, it's two dimensions, um, four possible values on each side. Very simple idea. And I'm just going to talk through the order in which you would hit cells and how you would behave in this kind of system using different approaches for ordering the data. And so this is my origin. And let's say I wanted to find all things close to this. The approach that we saw, the comparison function that basically checks for equality and then only then looks at other fields, would basically do something like this. Where as long as something was in a column, it would be considered close. 
if you had to jump a column, it'd be considered far away. Now we can look at this and we can know this isn't what we want. But that approach does work sometimes. And actually a lot of the time. That's why we all probably spend a lot of time running code that looks like that, because it works most of the time. These are cases where it works really well. If you are looking for a particular office in an office complex, you might start with building, and then you might have floor, and then aisle, and then door. If you have an address, it's OK to start with country, and then narrow it down to state or province, or whatever the terminology is based on the area, and then go to city, and then to street, and then to street number. And the same thing if we were you know, all going to go to a game at the stadium. It'd be OK if we looked at section first and made sure that they were equivalent on section before we looked at row and looked at number. And this, the reason why this works is because the data has a natural priority. Uh, it's just inherent to it. And so we can leverage that priority. And if we're smart, we'll actually do the comparison in an order that leverages that as well. And so this is, again, Julia code that kind of shows the stadium example. And just to illustrate it, um, if we were looking for four seats together, this would find it for us. This, this would work. Now, I talked a lot about how ultimately we're trying to do this mapping of multidimensions into a single value. And so I want to prove to you that those comparison functions do that. And what I like to think about is that that comparison function tells us the order in which the items will be visited. And that order in which those items will be visited can be that magic value for us. So it can be that single value. So basically, z becomes the position in the ordering. I'm also going to argue that doing this based approach is a shortcut for concatenating all of the bits of the members into a single number. And so that would look like this. If we had x and y, values 9 and 3, we have you know, two bit representations. When we use that type of comparison in order to order the data, we end up with one big number that represents if we just smush them two together. And in this case, it would be 147. So back to that grid I said I was going to use as a way to visualize this. If we watched how we would move through the data if we were ordering it, because again, I'm saying that ordering is actually that magic number, we would move through it like this. So what shape did that make? Well, that made a nice little N. It looks just like an N. And that's in that simple, simple picture right there. If we bring that to a bigger, bigger shape like we just did, we could walk through it again. This is the order they would hit. And now we have a bunch of ends just snuggled up against each other. Um, but there's a problem in that ends have these big jumps. And that means that in this kind of approach, we have things that aren't really close together that we're claiming are close together because the ordering says they are. And that's why we have the Sacramento problem. We have another problem as well, which is as we scale up the model, um, it doesn't match anymore. The, the, that number for things changes as we make a bigger grid. And so that's not very helpful. And so it has some inconsistency as it scales, that kind of approach. So can we do better? Well, I hope so, because that's what I'm supposed to tell you about. First, I have to ask, what do we want? Like, what's important to us? Because chances are we're going to make some trade-offs. That's most of what we do in engineering, is we make some sort of trade-off. And so in this case, we're going to have to make some. But first, we have to know what we really care about. Well, I really care about um, the fact that things that are far away aren't considered close in our approach. Because that's what's really going to annoy me, is having to, to go far out of my way to find something when there was something closer to me, and the system just didn't find it. And I call that the I do not drive to Sacramento for fast food rule. So what we want from a picture standpoint is we want behavior more like this. So if it's only one unit away in any direction, it's close. If it's two units, then it's a little farther and on back. And that doesn't matter for which point is the search point. It should always work no matter which point we pick. And you're probably thinking, that's obvious. Why would she even say that? Um, the reason I say that is because I used to ask this as an interview question uh, when I would interview new engineers. Experienced, early career, doesn't matter. Use this as an interview question. It's a great conversation about how they approach technical problems. And I would find the number of candidates, both experienced and early career, that would propose to me that they would just calculate all the distances and then sort the data by that and then do a binary search was, was quite high. 
And so I'd have to talk through in the interview how, well, that doesn't actually work, because when I change the origin, you have to re-sort all the list. And from that standpoint, we're just back to brute force, right? Like, that's not, that's not any better. So what's another idea? Well, um, concatenating the bits was silly. Could we interleave them? So could we take one bit from each dimension and start appending and building a number that way? Is that an idea? You know, is that foolish? Is that naive? Is that awesome? You know, we're going we're to find out, of course. Um, so it would look like this. So we have our 9 and 3 example again. Um, we have the two numbers. We just work through. And this would work no matter how many dimensions you have. You could do it with 3 or 4. You just keep picking bits off. You do have to understand that your number is going to grow. If you started with two 32-bit numbers, then you're going to need a 64-bit number and keep rolling on up as you do this. And the new ordering would be 135 for that coordinate um, based on this new approach. And, you know, Julia code, pretty simple uh, to work with. I've, I've done a lot of bit operations in my career for whatever reason, and so this, I read this and it's obvious to me right away, but if you haven't done a lot of bit operations, good for you. Um, it's not always fun to do a lot of bit manipulation. Uh, but that's, basically this is just doing the interleaving of the data. And this is what our grid would look like now. So uh, the numbers indicate the order that we'd hit them, and then I had the bit representations for what would be a two by two, um, two bit by two bit representation. And we can walk through it. And just kind of see how it hits. And there we go. So that looked better, right? As we were watching it move through, it looked a little better. Um, and hey, it made a Z. Um, different, different letter. Oddly enough, a lot of things I do today are going to look like letters. And if we look at it in a bigger picture, we'd actually have Z's that connect to Z's, that connect to Z's, and then kind of make another Z. And then I just want to see what it looks like bigger. So a Z, Z, connect to Z's, and that's the picture. And so the interleave doesn't actually look that bad now, right? Maybe it's leaning towards the awesome part, not so much foolish or naive. Um, and so we really should call it, give it a good name. And so we could call it Z order. That's what a lot of people call this because of all the Z's. Um, we could go one step further and call it by its real name, which would be better, which is Morton, because uh, you know we want to give the guy who discovered it some credit. And the great thing about this approach, the great thing about Morton, is that you don't even have to do the work of interleaving the bits. Just like the comparison functions we write all the time, those boilerplate ones, are a shortcut for bit concatenation because we didn't have to concatenate the bits. There are shortcuts for the Morton-based approach as well, where basically all you have to do is test the most significant bit of each dimension and can just move on down until you find the first difference. And then you can kind of short circuit out of the process and it's more efficient. When I remove all the Z's and we look at the places where we had to kind of stitch them together, we had to connect them, um, we've got these green lines left over. And some of them probably look bad, uh, especially that one in the middle. It makes a huge jump. And when we have those huge jumps, what that means is that we have something in our data that looks close together but really isn't. Um, that's because they, from the curve standpoint, their distance is only one because they're only one ordering away from each other. But in the grid, they're actually much, much further apart, as we can see. Um, and so some things that are close in space also seem far in this approach. We don't have the green lines to really show that off, but I can kind of point out two points. Those things are really only one unit away, but in this model, uh, they look very far away. In fact, if you count up the order, I think they're about 22 positions away. And so if you're driving your car and you're running out of gas and you're trying to find the nearest gas station, you might get pretty pissed because the system is going to tell you to drive right by that one and go to one that's a little further away from you. However, the overall ordering is good. Um, so if you really cared about the, that the first and last item were really kind of completely opposite each other, um, this approach would, would actually work quite well for you because they are. So maybe there's something inherently wrong with the Z. We didn't like the N. Um, maybe the Z is problematic too. So let, let's try a different shape. Let's try this. So that's an upside down U is what I'm calling it. Uh, if we look at the coordinates that we're passing through in terms of order, we go from 0, 0, and then we go to 0, 1, and then 1, 1, and then 1, 0. And if you're 
used to looking at a lot of bits, or if you have a background in maybe some electrical engineering, you might notice that it's only one bit flipping as we move through the shape. And there's a name for that. It's called gray code. A gray code is a numbering system that was designed with that in mind. Um, binary is a great numbering system. It's easy to understand, at least for the people in this room. Others, maybe not so much. Uh, but it is hard from a standpoint of sort of electrical engineering because you're always having to move a whole bunch of bits at once. And back in the old days, there was a lot of concern about that being error prone. So they came up with this idea of um, what if we could have an approach that basically only flipped one bit as you're moving through the numbering system. The most well-known way to calculate a gray code is this code, um, which basically says return n xord with half of itself, and that will give you a really easy, quick um, gray code that will have the behavior you want in the ordering you want. And just to kind of show how that works, uh, here's 0 through 15 in that gray code. And you can watch the, numbering, the number representations are not what we're used to. But as we move through it, only really one bit is ever flipping. And that's kind of what we might want to apply here, because we have this system, and when we move and order the items, we only really want to shift by a little bit, because we want to maintain that proximity, maintain that locality in the distance. So maybe we can leverage this. And so maybe, maybe next idea is we say, OK, we take a gray code, and we do the bit interleaving, because we liked that. It just wasn't good enough. And let's just throw this stuff together and see what happens. So let's see what happens. OK, so that looks a little weird. If we draw what was happening, uh, it was doing this. So that, that is bad. That is very bad. Um, in fact, let's never do that again. <laughs> that was a horrible, horrible idea. Forget I ever showed it to you. Um, and please, just, just don't do it. The shape wasn't bad, though. Um, the shape was OK. The problem was how we stitched it together. So let's look at another way to stitch this together. So um, we're going to start with the bigger space, because obviously the, the simple one's really easy. And I'm just going to kind of stick them on there and rotate them a little bit. So that goes there, that goes there, goes there. Hey, not bad. So let's look at it bigger. I'll stick one there, I'll stick one there, stick one there, stick one there, and I'll stitch them together. Not bad either, right? Uh, so the code to do this is not pretty. I'm not going to pretend right now that it's easy by any means. Um, we have to figure out when to rotate things, and, and that's not always an easy decision because we're, our brains don't usually think like that. And then we have to do some of that gray code magic as well as doing some of the bit interleaving at the same time. And we, it's not pretty again. It's, it's not easy to understand code. But it's, it's small. Um, and if I take it and I kind of make bigger and bigger grids, so I used Gadfly for this so I could take the Julia code and kind of generate a bigger one and see what it looks like. And so I could kind of see this wonderful as I grow up, it just keeps filling that space. It just keeps kind of tightly turning and, and doing a really good job of ordering everything. So this is not terribly elegant nor easy to understand, but it works. So it's, it's better than the other two approaches we've seen. And I can show that it works because I remove the shapes, and this is where we, we stitch things together. And every time we stitch things together, we've only really moved one unit in the grid. So we're not having these big jumps in data. And that means that things that are close in the curve are also close in space. We're, we were able to, to do that and, and have that work out. Unfortunately, some things that are close in the space are not close in the curve. We saw that with the, with the Z order as well, with the Morton, but that's still here. Um, and then we didn't really get that absolute ordering. Um, the thing that is first and the thing that last aren't really the, first, the farthest apart things. But, but overall, it worked pretty well. It got us what we needed. So some of you are disappointed right now, I'm sure. I, my talk was practical fractals, and I just bored you with bit operations for you know, the last, uh, we're going on 25 minutes. Well, I want to prove to you that these are actually fractals. Um, these are. 
They're not fractals like we like to think about. Uh, you know, when we think of fractals, we think of the Mandelbrot set, we think of this part of the Julius set, these beautiful pictures that ended up being posters on my friend's um, apartment room walls. Or we, maybe we think of these shapes. I actually, these are some of my favorite fractals, the, the weird ones that are kind of counterintuitive and how they manipulate space. Um, this one is a pyramid that you, you subtract out pyramids and you keep doing that until eventually your pyramid's empty even though it's a solid, which is just really cool. Or we think of a lot of times the Mandelbrot set, which is the most famous one, and I used Gadfly again to, to generate that and Julia for fun. Well, let's look at the properties of these things. Um, I don't think pretty is a property of a fractal, uh, nor do I think cool is one either. So we have to be a little more rigid than that. So the first important thing is that they have to be self-similar. You have to kind of see that recursion play out as you're looking at them. The, you also have to be nowhere differentiable. That's, that's another requirement of it. Um, you know, we can't find a line tangent to the curve at any point. And then a little more kind of weird is that you have to have this Hausdorff dimension that's greater than your topological dimension. Whereas topolo topological dimension is how we think of dimensions. You know, we think of lines and, and points and solids and, and polygons as all having a certain dimension no matter what they look like. The other dimension, the Hausdorff, is more kind of something that talks about how things really behave um, independent of their structure. So these things are self-similar. We saw that as we were building them up. You know, we started with the Z for the simplest case, and then we put the Zs together in the shape of a Z. And we can keep doing that on and on and up in bigger and bigger spaces. Same thing with the Hilbert, which is the name for it, is that we started with that U, and then we connected them to make a U, and then we connected those to make a U. So, so hopefully you agree with me at this point that there is that self-similarity in these things. They are also nowhere differentiable. Um, this is an animation, I got it off of Wikipedia, it's, it's great, uh, that shows you that as you do more and more iterations of these, of these curves, they actually fill the space. And in order to fill the space, that's what it means by it went white, it's not actually just that the screen went bad, it's like it, it filled the space with the curve. Uh, in order to fill the space, they have to turn so tightly that you lose the ability to find a line tangent to them. So that's, that's kind of cool. Coming from a math geek, I, I love that. Um, and then they do have that behavior in that their topological dimension doesn't actually match how they behave. Because these things are lines, um, which should be you know, one dimensional. And yet, as we progress in the iterations and we implement them, they actually fill a two-dimensional space. Their Hausdorff dim dimensions actually is two. They're considered two. So the funny thing is, is that these things were discovered a long, long time ago. Um, this is not really cutting edge technology. The Hilbert curve, which is the one that looks like the little U's, was discovered in 1891 by David Hilbert. He wasn't really trying to solve any sort of geographic problem. Of course, he didn't know that, that Garmin would someday come into existence. But what he was doing is that he and another man named um, uh, Giuseppe Piano we're playing with the idea of could you take a unit square, which is you know, just like a unit circle except it's square, and if you had a curve or a continuous function, could you fill it? And they were kind of playing with like countability and cardinality and different you know, counterintuitive behaviors of things. And no one really believed at the time you could do this. And uh, Giuseppe Piano proved that you could. Um, and he, he found the first space filling curve. Uh, his mistake was that when he wrote his paper, he didn't draw any pictures of it. So back to things being visual are, is important. Um, and so what happened is that David Hilbert came after him and documented the Hilbert curve, and he got a lot of publicity because it was this really cool picture in the middle of the paper. Now, Mandelbrot, who is the father of the term fractal, didn't coin it until the mid-70s. Uh, and so these men had discovered fractals before we even knew what to call them. Even Morton uh, found it before fractals were a name. He found the Morton curve in 1966. He was trying to solve a problem of geographic data. He had some files on a file system that he wanted to sequence based on their geographic location. And he needed a way to do that. And he came up with the idea of interleaving the bits. 
and, and that's um, how we got the Morton curve. And I apologize, I couldn't find a picture of him. Um, I guess, you know, not all computer scientists are that famous, but. So hopefully I've convinced you that they are fractals. Uh, now I have to convince you that they're practical. So we write a lot of code like this, as I've said before, and when we're trying to solve with this multidimensional problems. And this works for some cases, but there's a lot of cases where it doesn't work. But we need some sort of comparison function because we need to be able to take our data and figure out how to shove it into some sort of structure that we're already familiar with. And those structures usually require some way to compare it. So we can actually use that number, now that we've done that mapping of our multiple dimensions into a new number, which is the Hilbert number, or if you wanted to use Morton, the Morton number. And you can use that as your comparison function as your means to order the data. And once you do that, you can get back to the very simple algorithms that you already know and love, like binary search, or a binary search tree, or skip lists. I put R tree up there because Hilbert has been used to optimize R trees as well. But any kind of data structure that you could traditionally search using some sort of compare space function, you can now work with multiple dimensions using one of these, these approaches. I, we did a lot of binary, just plain old binary search with this um, where, I, where I worked. And so just basically map it all into one big array and, and do the search, and it, it worked quite well. And so I also want to show you that it's not just navigation systems. That's the obvious one, because we can all wrap our heads around you know, that we have these locations, and they have dimensions, and we have to get to them. But there, there are other places that multidimensional problems show up. Um, and you know, again, in that space, we were just looking for a searchable index of geographic features. But there's other searchable indexes that we need somewhere. So image search is a good example. Uh, we could use this as a means to search an image for some sort of, of object within that image. Um, images in their nature are two-dimensional. Um, you can also represent them already as a single dimension, but if you wanted to leverage the spatial locality of something in that image, you could use an approach like this to do it. I actually did read an article of a guy who was using this on uh, binary images, uh, meaning like executables and things, as a way of trying to reverse engineer what's in the image. So he would go in and he would look to figure out like if he saw some patterns in blocks in the file that he could kind of figure out in that binary file, this is what was going on. Completely different type of image, but interesting nonetheless. Another way it might show up would be collision detection. Um, when we want to know in some sort of space, are two things likely to be in the same location and we want to do something with them? Or if you work for a company that has a big, big warehouse and you have aisles and you have rows and you have shelves, maybe you need to figure out how to search within that warehouse based on those three dimensions. And that leads to a quick and obvious jump to the idea of, well, maybe a data center. Because um, data centers are really you know, warehouses full of machines that we want to leverage. And I'm not the first person to have this idea, because as we learned this morning, no ideas are new. Everyone's had all the ideas before. And so if you've worked with Slurm, the um, simple Linux utility for resource management, and you go poking around in their source code, because it is open source, uh, you will find Hilbert.c. And they basically use Hilbert, they use the Hilbert curve in order to make sure that jobs that need to be spatially local within the cluster run together. So they stick them all, all the, all the machines, all the nodes in the cluster in one big array, organized by Hilbert order, and then they just kind of try to find sections within that that are close so that they can make sure the jobs run together. And so the thing that makes these, this great for these problems is that they do kind of fit that pattern of a grid. And, and not just a grid in two dimensions, but we could also go on to three dimensions. And so since they work great for grids, we have to figure out how do we identify that the problem space we're working in looks like a grid. Like we need to know that we're dealing with a grid so we can use these approaches. And basically, I kind of think of a grid as anything that has dense data with multiple dimensions or keys or fields or whatever name we want to give it that have similar cardinality. So we kind of see roughly the same things along different axes. They could be different values, because they could be a different scale, but they roughly the same number of different types of values. 
Now, when I did these slides, I did everything in 2D, um, and that's because uh, 2D is easier for us to wrap our brains around. Uh, if I tried to do a bunch of three-dimensional images, you would probably not be able to follow them at all. Plus, the code's a lot simpler <laughs> in, in 2D. In fact, if you ever do try to take this approach and with some code, um, go out and look at some of the generalizations, versions of the algorithm that allow it to work in multiple dimensions because uh, it, it'll be much, much better for you than using my uh, lovely hack together bit code. And so to show you that it works even in 3D, here is a 3D rendering of the Morton curve. And then here's one of the Hilbert curve. I do have this with me today. And so if you run into me later on, I, I, will, I will show it to you. It's really awesome because um, I got it from a 3D print shop and they, the, the plastic is kind of flexible, and so you can actually like stretch it out and play with it. And um, when, I, when I got it, the person was showing me that a girl had it like as a hair tie, which was hilarious. And so you know, feel free to stop me, and I'll show it to you today. It's a little small to show the room, so that's why I'm not bringing it out. Of course, we have to ask about when doesn't this work. Um, we never, nothing ever works perfectly all the time. And as we went through the different examples, I kind of showed that there's some things that Morton did better. One, it's easier to understand. Um, and there were things that Hilbert did better, but both of them made compromises. Um, both of them had situations where it wasn't perfect in terms of the ordering. Well, there are also situations when they don't really work. Um, for one, if you have a mismatch in your dimensions in terms of the number of possible values. In fact, Hilbert and most of the implementations of Hilbert really assume kind of like you have a power of two. Um, so it works really well if you're dealing with you know, integer-based numbers. You can actually extend it to work in floats as well, but if you have something that works in a power of two, it works, it works really well. Um, but if you have something like this, and of course it would probably be more than eight, it'd probably be like 80,000, but I can't fit that on my screen. Uh, you wouldn't want to use this approach because there's just too much mis mismatch. Um, it also doesn't work uh, when you have the curse of dimensionality. Uh, the curse of dimensionality is a term that's been thrown around a lot, especially more and more with data analytics and data mining. This idea that you know, some spaces we're working in, some problem spaces, have so many different features and so many different dimensions that the approaches that we take to work with them kind of fall flat uh, because we don't have enough data to justify the approach we're taking. Usually you hear it from in terms of machine learning, like you need a bigger training space because you have so many dimensions. But the problem shows up any time you're working with multidimensional data, that if you have lots and lots and lots of dimensions, uh, the approaches you take to work with it just start kind of degrading in terms of how valuable they are um, if you don't have lots and lots of data to go with it at the same time. So I wanted to kind of end with this quote that I love um, from Mandelbrot. Uh, when he was asked about fractals, he said, uh, beautiful, damn hard, increasingly useful, that's fractals. And, and I, I'm really excited to see that coming true, that as, as we move, um, we work in more and more systems, that we're finding more use for this wonderful, beautiful math. And I hope that it will continue to be true, and we'll see more and more uses. And so with that, um, I'm Michelle Brush. I work at Cerner, uh, and I also, you know, big math geek. And um, I'm out of time, um, pretty much. So what I'm going to do is just say, again, come up to me later if you want to talk about something. I'll show you the little cube. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you.